Well, as you know, we come together once a month to celebrate communion. That's not unusual. Many churches do the exact same thing. They gather together usually once a month. Some churches will have communion uh, every single uh, Sunday. But, but our tradition here is we have the Lord's Supper on a monthly basis. But we do something a little different, I think, than a lot of churches. I've, like you, have been in certain congregations where you go to a worship service, and it seems like it's kind of an afterthought. They just kind of tack it on at the end. Well, instead of squeezing communion into our worship service, I've always thought that it's so much better to have a fuller appreciation for the Lord's table by giving it our undivided attention. You see, communion is so significant as a part of the Christian worship experience that it really is worthy of our full focus, our complete concentration. And this demands that we're not in a hurry, that we're not just rushing through the service to add it as a, a PS to our worship services, but rather that we give it the time that it rightfully deserves. Now, we could examine all sorts of issues that could enhance our experience with the Lord's table. There are lots and lots of different things that we can discuss. But one of the most important elements of the Lord's table deals with communion and confession. Those two go together. And so that's what I'd like for us to consider today, is the importance of a confession. Confession is vitally important for us preparing to partake of the bread and the cup together, so much so that it behooves us to take a close look at this whole matter of celebrating communion and sing to it that we have confessed our sins. A good, healthy confession is much cheaper than spending time with a good therapist. A number of years ago, I was speaking with the administrator of the Psychiatric and Psychological Evaluation and Testing Services at the Mid-Counseling Center of Encino, California. Now, there's a mouthful for you, isn't it? And at that time, I was told that a highly educated psychiatrist uh, earns $200 an hour. And back then, if there was a psychiatrist who was involved in, in writing books and lecturing and went so far as uh, to have a, a private practice, then that individual can make anywhere between half a million to one million dollars a year. Yeah, a good, healthy confession is way cheaper than a costly shrink, for sure. But beyond saving you all sorts of money, I'm sure you would agree that uh, a good, healthy confession is good for the soul. It does wonders for your spirit, for that, that inner part of who you are. And that's why... Here at Shepherd of the Hills Church, we provide regular opportunities to come together corporately to celebrate communion. We want to give you the opportunity, even if you have been hit and miss with your own relationship with God, we want to give you the opportunity to confess any sins to God, not to us, but to God in the context of a corporate assembly. Now, how are you doing with that? How are you coming along with celebrating communion and uh, confessing your, your sins uh, to God? Here's a news flash for you. You may be confessing your sins to God, and he may not even be, be listening to you when you confess them. Is that a shocker to you? It's true. You may be telling God about junk in your life, about some dirt that is offensive to him, and, and he's just like going, la, 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 la. I'm not interested. You say, really? I thought God 
He hears everything. He knows everything. It's true. God knows everything. But please don't miss the truth of Psalm 66, 18. The psalmist says something that we all know, even experientially. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord does not hear me. Not my words, God's word. If I'm holding on to sin, if there's an area in my life that is repugnant, it is, it is evil, it is offensive to God, then God says right there in his word, he doesn't hear us at that time. And so it's possible that you're not doing it right. You may be involved in confessing sins and God is not even listening to what you have to say. Now, the word confession, did you know it only shows up nine times in the entire Bible? That's it. Only nine times. We find it three times in 1 Timothy, three times in the book of Hebrews, twice in the book of Ezra, and once in 2 Corinthians. That's it. Now let's dig a little deeper. The Hebrew word for confession is yada. Say it with me. Yada. Very good. That's the one and only Hebrew word you will learn today. Yada. The word itself takes on the meaning of acknowledging one's sin. We live in a day and age where people don't even acknowledge that they're sinning, that they're even doing anything wrong. Some may even want to steal a Bible every so often, or a laptop computer. But it's true. And so, when you are experiencing yada, you are acknowledging sin. That's what you're doing. That's exactly how the word is used over there in Leviticus chapter 5, verse 5, as well as Psalm 32, verse 5, and Job 40, verse 14. And so when you are involved in your own personal yada, guess what? You are acknowledging your sin. You are recognizing your sin. That's what you're doing. That's your yada event. Now, the New Testament uh, takes on a, a different nuance for the word confession. And there's a Greek. We know that the, the Hebrew Bible uh, was written from a different language from the New Testament. The New Testament is written in Koine Greek. And the Greek term for confession is homologeo. Homologeo. Say that with me. Homologeo. The word is quite interesting. It literally means to say the same thing. And so when you are experiencing homologeo, you're saying the same thing. You are saying when you're confessing sin. You are saying the same thing about your sin that God says about your sin. So instead of being in denial, you are actually in agreement with God. You are agreeing with Him. You're saying, yes, God. I am agreeing with you. I am saying the same thing about my sin that you say about it. Now, when we come to the Bible, I would personally have to say that the greatest chapter in all of Holy Writ that talks about confession has got to be Psalm 51. The entire chapter is completely devoted to one man's confession. He's like going into his own personal confessional. And he is experiencing his own yada, his own hamlageo experience. He is acknowledging before God, he's recognizing before God his sin. He is saying the same thing about his sin that God says about it. Now, it is in this special section of a scripture that you and I can discover how we can confess our sins appropriately. Because there is a lot of confession going on throughout the day. People confess even sins in different religions throughout the course of any 24-hour period of time. But we want to do it right. And your relationship with God is so incredibly important, it's essential that you understand biblical confession. And so that's what we're going to do. Starting today, and when we come back for the next several 
Sundays that we experience once a month communion, we're going to be looking at this penitential psalm, Psalm 51. So go ahead and turn there, if you will, to Psalm 51. While you're turning there, let me just mention that this psalm is really emotional. And it bears the marks of a heart that is deeply broken. It bears the marks of a heart that is deeply grieved over sin. This guy is a hurting pup. He's struggling. In fact, he knows his sin to the extent that he's beside himself. He knows that he blew it royally. And so he's coming clean. He's acknowledging before God how wrong he was. I'd like you to notice that even above verse 1, we discover what is known as a superscription. A superscription is an editorial title. The superscription itself is not inspired. God's word is inspired. Uh, but it is something that helps us to have a thumbnail sketch of what's going on in the entire psalm itself. Notice with me the superscription right above verse 1 where it says, For the choir director, a psalm of David, when Nathan the prophet came to him after he had gone into Bathsheba. Now, although this superscription was written uh, after the psalm was recorded, it is historically accurate. And what the superscription does is it introduces uh, to us who the author of the psalm is and uh, what was going on at the time, at least an inkling of some level of understanding of the circumstances uh, pertaining to the psalm. Now, even though David was a man after God's own heart. Even though David was one of the greatest kings of Israel, and certainly a standard that God that set before other kings, when you look through First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles in particular, David was a big time sinner. He was. In fact, I'll go so far as to say, if you were fully aware and that you witnessed David in action with his sins, and he were to sit right next to you this morning, you probably would get up from your chair and want to find another place to sit. You'd say, hmm, uh, I don't know about sitting next to this guy. This guy, he sent up a storm. If there was a movie today, 2023, that graphically portrayed David in action. No holds bar. I mean, just showed graphically what was going on with David. The movie would at least have to be an R-rated movie because of all the sex and violence in it. I mean, uh, we as believers would not, or at least I should say, should not see that movie. Uh, that's how hardcore this movie would be. His adulterous affair with Bathsheba, as well as his murderous subplot of her husband Uriah, was nothing less than scandalous at the time. Today you hear of people who are knocking off other people, you hear people who are having affairs, and people say, that's life. That's more of the new norm compared to back in the day when having sexual affairs and being involved in some murderous plot uh, would be truly scandalous. But at that time, it was something that was shameful. Hey, I don't know about you, but does it seem like there are even commercials on TV that are becoming more and more shameful? I mean, I, I put on the TV and, and I see a commercial with a, a couple of men starting to kiss. And I don't know about you, it like disgusts me. And I have to look down, I don't even want to look at that. When we were on vacation in, uh, in Pismo Beach, uh, there was a whole commercial about drag queens. And I, I heard one woman recently say, there's only one thing I really can't stand about drag queens, they do their makeup better than me. <laughs> but it's, uh, it's disgusting how our, our culture is just going down, down, down. And we've got to hold the standard. We've got to hold the bar high. 
And so, in light of this scandal situation, God had to go through a lot of trouble. It's not as though the omnipotent God gets tired or weary. He doesn't. But he had to go through all the trouble because David was not getting the, the idea. It wasn't like going through his head. And so Nathan, the prophet, has to go to David and call him on the carpet. He has to say, David. As, as Dave Gilliam, one of our elders, would say, you've got tilt going on. I've heard you use that expression at times. When, when our life is, is tilted like a pinball machine. And uh, maybe you've been playing pinball and, and the, the whole uh, game uh, goes uh, awry because maybe you were holding the machine incorrectly and, and you tilted the machine when playing pinball. Our lives can get like that pinball machine where they can become tilted. And so you can just see up in heaven, God is like looking down and saying, David isn't coming clean yet. I'm going to have to send Nathan. I mean, Nathan is the man. He's not going to be intimidated by David. He's going to tell him exactly what he needs to hear. Well, a question I have for you. Okay, time to put on your thinking caps this morning. Here's a question for you. If the superscription is accurate, then why is David so vague? Why is he so general about his sin? Think about it. Notice with me over here in this chapter, starting in verse 1. Does he name his sin? No. Verse 1, he says, he makes reference to my transgressions. Okay, he's taking ownership for it, but he's not calling it like it is. Verse 2, my iniquity and my sin. Dude, you, you can't be any more vague than that, right? My transgression, my sin. What is that? I mean, if I went up to you as uh, your pastor and I said, um, I, I'm going to ask for your forgiveness today, I have sinned. I have transgressed. I have rebelled. <laughs> Obviously, that would raise all sorts of questions in your mind. You'd like to know, what in the world is he talking about? Well, notice again how it continues to be vague over here. Verse 3, my transgressions and my sin. Verse 4, I have sinned and done what is evil. Drop down to verse 9. My sins and all my iniquities. If David was any more indirect, we would think that he was concealing or hiding his sins rather than revealing them. Why does David not name them one by one? Why is he confessing, but at the same time also in hiding? Why isn't he being specific and candidly naming them one by one? After all, think about it. When you're talking to God about your sin, you're not telling him anything he doesn't already know. He's all-knowing. He's omniscient. He knows everything about everything. And so for David, just to come clean should have been easy for him. But he just, he couldn't bring himself to that place. Why wouldn't he just be specific about his sins? Haven't there been times in your life when being open and candid about how you have blown it, how you have offended someone, it's, it's too difficult for you to be specific? Haven't there been times when you you did the wrong thing, and, and you thought to yourself, ah, I just, I, I, I know I should tell the person what I did wrong, but I, I'm just having such a hard time with this. I could just see a, a teenage girl going up to her mom and say, Mom, you and I need to have a talk. I, I, I need to tell you something right now that, that you're not going to like. Uh, you've told me over and over again that I shouldn't do a certain thing but I, I failed you. I, I, I did something wrong, Mom. And I, I just want you to know that this is really hard for me, but I, I need you to be aware that there's something that tripped me up recently, and, and, and I'm just really sorry. Please forgive me. There are times when it's, it's difficult to be extremely explicitly clear how we have blown it in a certain area. Haven't you ever been evasive when it came to you 
owning up to messing up? Yeah, I think we've all been there. Every one of us. We know what this is like. So let's not have stones in our hands to, to throw at David because there's, there's a David in, in each of us. David is refraining from spelling out the full-blown, high-tech, big-screen version of his sins. His sins are too scandalous. They are too hurtful for him to even make reference to them specifically. It's too difficult. And so he's vague. He's general. But I'd like you to notice how he does allude to one of them over here in verse 14. I mean, you have to almost be done with the chapter. You have to almost be done with his prayer before you recognize how he's being specific. Notice over in verse 14, he says, Deliver me from blood guiltiness. Now, when was David guilty of shedding blood? Think about that for a moment. When was David guilty of shedding blood? Actually, a better question is, when did David not shed blood? I mean, he was always shedding blood. He was one of the ultimate blood shedders of all time. In fact, he's known for shedding blood. We always talk about David and Goliath. He took out a guy who would have dwarfed Shaquille O'Neal back in the day. I mean, this was a big dude, this Goliath guy. And David, bam, took him out. And so David was known for taking out Goliath. And right on the heels of that, that, that death, at the hands of, of David, or shall I say at the stone of David, uh, after 1 Samuel 17, listen to what it says in 1 Samuel 18, verses 6 and 7. The women came out of all the cities of Israel, singing and dancing. That would be a dream for many men. You come into the city, and you have a bunch of women who are singing and dancing because they're celebrating you. And that was David's experience. And they're not just singing and dancing to meet uh, of, the, of Israel. They're singing and dancing to meet King Saul, but it doesn't, it's not going to stop there. And they're coming with tambourines. They were part of their praise team back in the day. And they're doing it with joy and with musical instruments. And you're going to dig on their lyrics. Uh, it says, And the women sang as they played and said, Saul has slain his thousands. I mean, we have some very creative people in our praise team. And they are so gifted. If I were to say right now, I want you to, on an impromptu level, come up with a, uh, a melody that goes uh, with these lyrics, you probably could pull it off, but I'm not going to put you on the spot. But we have these lyrics, and they're singing. Saul has slain his thousands, and... David his ten thousands. I mean, Saul is good. But David, he's our man. I mean, David is ten times better than Saul, basically, is what they're singing, right? In 2 Samuel 8, verse 5, it reads, David killed 22,000 Arameans. I told you he was into shedding blood. He was hardcore as a bloodshedder. He was into it. God obviously knew that about David, and he says to David in 1 Chronicles 22, verse 8, You have shed much blood and have waged great wars. You shall not build a house to my name because you have shed so much blood on the earth before me. Now, I find it interesting to note that David doesn't feel bad about this. David has been involved in, in mass bloodshedding, if you will. And he doesn't feel guilty. He hasn't done anything wrong. He knows it. There's no guilty conscience over all of these people who he's killed. And the reason for that was because David was involved in killing God's enemies. David's enemies were the enemies of God you see, God had told the Jewish people to wipe out the heathen idolatrous nations who were in the land of Israel. 
David was just doing what God had ordered the Jewish people to do. God told us to take them out. I'm doing it. It would be very different for us as obedient Christians to have that as a commission upon our lives. How would you feel? Some of you would be squirming. Wait, 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 wait. God wants me to be involved in mass killings? Okay, they're, they're your enemies, I get it, but you know, I, I don't even like the sight of blood and you're going to ask me to take out people? Uh, I don't know about this, God. David's all, bring them on. Bring them on. I'm your man. I'm a, a warrior for you, God. I'm a champion for the, the king of hosts, uh, the heaven's champion. I, I am, I'm your man. And so he doesn't feel guilty about this. By wiping out his enemies, David was actually fulfilling God's word. He was just doing what God told him to do. He was following orders. As a matter of fact, we are told in 1 Chronicles 17, 8, that God is reassuring David he was doing the right thing when God says to David, I have been with you wherever you have gone and have cut off all your enemies from before you. So that begs the question, if God himself was involved in assisting David with taking out his enemies, with killing all of these people that hated the true and living God of Israel, then why is David feeling guilty over shedding blood? Th this seems to be confusing, doesn't it? God orders David to shed blood. God commends him for doing so, and yet David is going through his own personal guilt trip. He's struggling. So, pray tell, what is this about? The answer is found in 2 Samuel 12, verse 9. You don't need to turn there, but in that verse, we're told about Nathan the prophet confronting David. And he says to the king, Why have you despised the word of the Lord by doing evil in his sight? Now let's stop for a moment. Think about any president of our country. It doesn't have to be the, the current president, but any president in our country. Can you imagine anybody going up to the president of the United States and saying, hey, Prez, why have you despised the word of the Lord by doing evil in his sight? What's wrong with you? Can you imagine anybody, whether they are a prophet or not, actually saying that? To our president? It's a hard press for me to consider that. Uh, but Nathan, he doesn't backpedal. He says, You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword, have taken his wife to be your wife, and have killed him with the sword. Now you're familiar with the story. I can just uh, envision a youth recounting this story. Uh, with these bullet points. King sees haughty. King wants haughty. King has his way with haughty. And then what we're told is that this super hot babe comes up to Dave and says, Excuse me, Your Majesty. Can I call you Dave? Okay, I'll call you Dave. Dave, do you remember that night of passion we had the other day? Um, I, I hate to break the news to you. Um, this is a hard thing to say. I'm pregnant. That would be the Cliff Notes version of that. So we've all heard this story. Uh, we know what happens. And so David has his thinking cap on. He's thinking, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. What am I going to do? Uh-oh, 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 uh-oh. I'm in trouble now. So what David does is he, he comes up with this, this plot. He has this master-minded way of resolving this significant challenge in his life. He thinks to himself, okay, that Uriah guy, Bathsheba's husband, he's fighting right now. I'm going to have to... I'm going to have to find out where he is. 
and, and send a messenger to him. And then I'm going to have this messenger tell Uriah uh, to leave uh, uh, the war that he's involved in and, and, and come home and, and, and have a, a nice, intimate, romantic evening with your wife. And so that's what David does. He has uh, the messenger that goes to Uriah. Uriah comes back to Jerusalem. But Uriah decides, um, I'm not going to spend this time with my, my honey. I, I, I miss her, and it would be wonderful for us to uh, share a time of, of, of love and romance, but I'm not going to go there. And so David's thinking, oh, no. Oh, uh-oh. <laughs> Uh, I, I need a plan B here. I need another option. And so what David does at this point is he says, okay, that didn't work out. What I'm going to do is I'm going I'm to have Uriah uh, go back on the front lines, and I'm going to have the other soldiers withdraw themselves. I'm going to have them retreat so that basically Uriah is all left alone by himself, defending himself. And that's exactly what happened, and Uriah was killed. As far as David is concerned, it was mission impossible that was accomplished. It worked out. His plot worked. He got the girl, and he was able, able to have Uriah boosted into eternity. It worked out exactly. And perhaps he had a sigh of relief when that happened, based on that murderous uh, plot. But, and I'm talking about a, a big but here, David was tormented with his conscience. He couldn't live with himself. He was struggling. There was internal turmoil going on in his spirit. He was battling with himself. He was frustrated. He, he knows the Lord. He really does have a relationship with God. He, this, this is a man after God's own heart. But he was an adulterer and he was an accomplice to murder. And those are two of the Ten Commandments that he broke, obviously. So his conscience is tormenting him. He's experiencing this unrelenting guilt that just will not leave him. Question. Is that where you're at this morning? Notice my eyes are not lingering on anyone at, the, at this moment. Pastor, do you agree that's a good thing to do? When you get too penetrating, you don't want to just linger at one person. But that's my question to you. Is, is that where you're at this morning? Is your conscience tormenting you? Are you struggling? Do you feel like you have rebelled against God? Maybe you haven't murdered anyone lately or ever. You haven't been involved in some sexual scandal. But you blew it royally. You know it. God knows it. Your conscience is plaguing you. Are you being tormented on the inside? Have you let someone down? Have you let the Lord down? How long will you continue in that state? How long will you persist in allowing that self-torturous experience to have its, its effect upon you? How long will you allow yourself to be tormented? How long will you not be right with God. Let's just say it like it is. A day? A week? A month? I've learned this long ago, and I continue to remind myself of it. It's important to keep short accounts with God. We were reading before together, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And the present tense of, if we confess, this is an ongoing thing. Hey, I don't know about you, but it just seems like I'm confessing all the time. God, I, I, I didn't have a good attitude back then. Or I said something I probably should not have said. In fact, I'll take away the word probably. I, I said something I should not have communicated. God, my, my, my thoughts were all jacked up. They, they were not where they should have been. God, please forgive me. 
I, I continually am involved in confessing something to God. The more exposure we have to God's word, the standard, the more we see a gap between the truth and our lives and how we don't meet that level of perfection. And where that gap is ought to prompt us to be involved in confessing, having our own yada moment, recognizing, acknowledging our sin, our own hamlageo, saying the same thing about our sin that God says about it. And so as your pastor who loves you and wants the very best for you, please keep short accounts with God. Regularly be in the habit of acknowledging how you have sinned in thought, word, or deed before the Lord. And the thing I want you to see is when you do your part, God does his part. Think again with me. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins. God does his job. We do our job. We do our part. I would like to invite you right now. We've said a whole lot about confession. We've thought about the life of David and how that, that may apply to our lives. I'd like for you to spend a little time in self-examination, just running a little self-inventory, thinking about your life, where you're at with the start of this new year, what changes that God wants you to make in your life. This is our time to come clean before the Lord. This is not you talking to your neighbor about some area in your life where you need to grow. This is you, you talking to the Lord. So let's spend some time in self-examination, shall we?